Today is the fourth Sunday of Lent, and we're looking at the parable of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15 this week. And this is one of my favorite passages of the entire Bible. The parable of the prodigal son is perhaps one of the best known parables that there are. Actually, I should say half of this parable is well known. All too often when we teach this parable, we chop it in half. By the end of this video, you should have a good handle on the entire parable and how it fits together. Also, how this parable is related to its larger context within Luke's Gospel, and hopefully see how this parable is designed to provoke your theological thinking and thoughts about who God is. So let's grab some coffee and dive in. You're watching the Caffeinated Bible, and my name is David Paris, and the goal of this channel is to take what I've been teaching and researching and writing in graduate schools and seminary for the past 20 or 30 years and bring it to you on YouTube, anyone, anywhere in the world. So if you like these videos, please take a moment and subscribe, give it a thumbs up, and share it with other people. That would really help me out a great deal. Thanks. Luke chapter 15 opens with Jesus eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners. Now that's pretty par on the course for Jesus and his behavior. Though this time we have some Pharisees and scribes who are present as well, and they grumble about his associating with these people. Before we go any further, you need to realize that both the Pharisees and the scribes were good people. In fact, if you had lived during that time, you would have highly respected them as well. The problem is really on Jesus' side. He is eating and drinking with people who would have been very problematic for the small Galilean towns, but also from a Jewish religious perspective as well. As Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. The paradox here is that on the one hand, Jesus is sitting with sinners, but, on the other hand, he delights in the law of the Lord. How do you put these two antithetical concepts together? In response to their thought, Luke tells us that Jesus told them a parable. Actually, he's going to tell them three, but let's not quibble. On the one hand, these parables defend Jesus' actions. On the other hand, they reveal and illuminate something about the kingdom of God and God's nature. I'm going to skip over the first two parables, the parable of the lost sheep and the lost coin for the sake of time, but I have a video from last year on that. I'll have a link up here and underneath this video as well. What I would like to do is enter the time-space continuum and go back to last year's video on the parable of the prodigal son because I think I have a pretty good illumination on the progression that takes place between the parables of the lost sheep, lost coin, and the lost sons. Now, in the first parable, remember, the shepherd had a hundred sheep. So here's our hundred sheep right here. And if you lose one, that's one percent that you have lost. Now, with the woman who loses a coin, and we lose ten percent. With today's video, we've got a father who has two sons, and he's going to lose one of them. 1%, 10%, 50%. And also, by the final one, it's the loss of a child, which is far more important than a sheep or a coin. Okay, now I made a mess. I got to clean it up here. Picking up 100 rocks is not the quickest thing in the world. Welcome back. I'm going to read the first act here. I've divided this parable up into five acts just to make these chunks a little bit more digestible. This parable opens in Luke 15, 11, where Jesus says there was a certain man who had two sons. Now, we don't know if this man is Jewish, Galilean, Jerusalem, or Gentile. He is just man X who has two sons. This makes it a universal story that it can apply to anyone just about anywhere. The Pharisees and the scribes would have recognized these opening words with themes within the Bible. Cain and Abel, Isaac and Ishmael, Jacob and Esau. However, Jesus introduces a twist in this theme from the Old Testament. The younger son does not turn out to be the righteous, like Abel, faithful, like Isaac, cunning or clever, like Jacob. 
Instead, he turns out to be an irresponsible and foolish child. Luke 15, 12 through 16. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had, and he took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him everything. Almost every parable has a provocative or sort of wow moment within them. And this parable has a number of them. The first one occurs when this younger son comes up to his father and he says, Father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. He wants his share of the inheritance. He wants it now and he's not willing to wait for his father to die. This request reveals his greed, the low regard he has for his family and for his father, and also his disregard for the law. In the Ten Commandments, we have the commandment to honor your father and your mother. He is definitely not doing that here. The second provocative element comes immediately on the heels of the first one. The father divides his property between the two sons. Now, just to geek out a little bit here, When Luke records this parable, he uses the word bios for property or inheritance. This term often refers to life. It's where we get biology from, the study of life. And like Greek, in English, we can talk about what a person does for their living. At the same time, when the father divides his bios, his life or his property between the two sons, I think the earliest readers would have seen that this involves more than just money. In a sense, the father is going to lose a large part of who he is with this son's actions. The provocative, wow, I didn't see that coming element in this story, is the father granting the younger son's request. In the parables of the lost sheep and the lost coin, we are specifically told that the shepherd and the woman lost the sheep and the coin. This time it is implied that the father's irresponsible actions are responsible for his losing his son. One of the things to notice as you go through the parables is to watch for verbal actions. These are very skeletal stories, but when you see a number of verbs used in a row, you should take note. In this case, the younger son gathers all he had. Then he takes a journey where he squandered his property. A famine arose, and finally he began to be in need. In these two verses, we get a very concise but thick description of the son's actions and his life. When he goes off to the far country, many teachers jump on the idea that we have a Jewish kid going out to live among the unclean Gentiles and it shows a disregard for his Jewish inheritance. During the time of the New Testament, Jewish believers were scattered throughout the Roman Empire and there really doesn't seem to be any religious prohibitions against them. They worked beside the Gentiles in the markets. They welcomed them into their synagogues. And you can clearly see examples of this throughout the book of Acts and Paul's journeys. I think what Jesus is trying to communicate that by journeying to a far country, this is more than just being geographically distant. He is emotionally separated from his family. The geographical distance highlights the emotional distance between the father and the son. In his moment of need, now, he goes out and he hires himself out to one of the locals. They send him into the field to feed the pigs. To be caring for pigs would definitely have signaled how low this kid sank from a Jewish perspective. But when even the pigs are eating better than he is, the Gentiles would have recognized just how low this boy has sunk as well. Garrett Von Jones, in his book, The Art and the Truth of the Parables, writes, The man of flesh and bones is now the man of skin and bones, facing an empty universe, and that's on page 202. This brings us to Act 2, Luke 15, 17 through 19. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, 
Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. Unlike the sheep and the coin in the first two parables, this son has not been found. Rather, he is described as coming to himself. What an interesting phrase that is. How do you come to yourself? As a phrase, it's very interesting because it describes a condition in which we are not ourselves. We are behaving or living in a way that is not true to who we are. And coming to ourselves is that moment when we recognize and recover who we really are. His inner monologue is interesting as well. In the parable of the rich man, that person thinks, what shall I do for I have no place to store my crops in Luke chapter 12. Rather than be generous and give to the poor, instead his idea is to build more barns. In the parable of the unrighteous judge in Luke 18, we have the story of this judge who keeps denying a widow justice, but she keeps pestering him. And he thinks to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continually coming. When we encounter inner thoughts or monologue within the parables, we need to realize that their thinking usually comes to conclusions that will be morally ambiguous at best. In this case, we know what he will say. We also know that this is all motivated by hunger. What we don't know if he is actually repentant or not. It forces us to think, is this kid genuine in what he is planning to say and ask of his father, or is he just doing this to feed his belly? Act 3, Luke 15, 20 through 24. And I'm reading from the English Standard Version today in case you're wondering. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quickly, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. In the first two acts, the son was the main character. Now the focus turns to the father. Once again, notice the verbs that are piled on in this section. His father saw him, felt compassion, ran, embraced, kissed. The father's actions in this section of the parable is another area where I think some teachers might get this wrong. You're going to find a lot claiming that a Jewish father would have never acted like this. It would have been really disgraceful. But once again, if we look at the New Testament, we get a picture for fathers. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus asks, or which one of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Matthew 7, verse 9. Or Jairus, who is a roar of a synagogue, when he hears that Jesus is in town, he runs to him and falls at his feet in the dirt. And he begs him, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. Mark 5.23 the picture that we gain from the New Testament accounts and in the parables as well of fathers is that fathers then, like now, have a very soft spot in their hearts for their children. In verse 21, the son is able to get out half of his rehearsed speech to his father. Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. The second line, treat me as one of your hired servants, is cut out. On the one hand, it gives us the impression that the father doesn't let him get his lines out or finish them because he is so excited to have him back. On the other hand, it sets us up for something that's going to happen later on in this parable. We know that the son doesn't say this, and by leaving it out, it sets us up for what the older son is about to say. Instead, the parable picks up with the verbal actions of the father. 
this time in the form of imperatives. Bring the best robes, put it on him, put a ring on his finger, put shoes on his feet, get the fattened calf, kill it, let us eat and celebrate. Then we get the father's reasoning for all this. For this son of mine was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Notice as well that it is the father who is overwhelmed with joy. All too often when we read or interpret this parable, we focus on the son repenting and coming back to his family, if he actually does. It's seen as a picture of the sinner who returns to God. But the emphasis here is on the father. He is the person doing all the action, giving all the commands and telling us why. This son of mine was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. T.S. Eliot, in his poem, Little Gidling, I think sums up this son's experience. He writes, The end of all of our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. This brings us to Act 4, Luke 15, 25 through 28, the first half. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music. And dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. If the younger son went off to a far land, when we meet the older son, he is out in the fields. Both sons are pictured as being geographically separated from their father. Now this son's not as far away though. As he draws near to the house though, he calls a servant to learn what the music and dancing was all about that he heard. The servant's response is telling, your brother has come and your father has killed. And he explains that the father has gotten the younger son back safe and sound. The older son's reaction is just the opposite of the father's. He was angry and he refused to go in. And he has good reason. His younger brother has shown the utmost contempt for the family. He took half their wealth, went off, and squandered it. Now he's back. He might be thinking, is this kid going to try and get more money out of their foolish father or not? What is he doing back here at the house? This brings us to act five, Luke 15, 28, the second half through verse 32. And his father came out and entreated him. And he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you and never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Like the younger son, the father goes out to meet this son as well. Remember when I said a few minutes ago, I know it seems like an attorney when you're watching a video, but I said that the younger son's confession was cut short. Look how this older son picks that up. All of these many years I have served you. He doesn't see himself as a son, but as a servant. The type of relationship that the younger son sought when he was returning home. John Barton, in his commentary on the parables, writes, In doing so, he reflects the insecurities, not of a son, but of a slave. For all these years I have worked like a slave for you, and have never disobeyed you. Both of these sons have a fractured relationship with their father. The younger son took his share of the inheritance and got as far away as possible. The older son stayed home, but he sees himself as a servant or a slave, not as a son. And like the younger son who squandered his wealth, the older son harbors similar desires, but never had them filled. 
you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. If the servant answered this older brother when he asked what was going on in the house with the phrases, your brother and your father, notice how the older son responds in this situation. He tells his father, this son of yours devoured your property. Again, the word for property here is bios in the Greek. He devoured your life with prostitutes. We don't know if the younger son did this or not, but by making this charge, he is saying that his father was complicit in enabling the younger son's behavior in this way. But the father responds in love to his older son as well. Notice, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. We're going to geek out for a moment here again. The word for son that is used here is technon. It doesn't specifically refer to a son, it refers to a child, and it is a very affectionate term. The father addressing this older son as technon is the first affectionate term that is used in this story. So far it has been son, father, brother, servant. From the father's perspective, this son should not feel threatened. All that he has is his, and he has been with him always. But for this son, this has not been a reality in his life. He sees himself as a slave who can't even have a small celebration with his friends. The older son's attitude displays his dysfunctional view of the family. He has made himself a slave for what is in reality already his. When the younger son returned, the father celebrated because my son was dead and now is alive. Now he tells the same thing to the older son, but with a small twist. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this, your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. The father celebrated because of the deliverance of the younger son. His motives were unselfish and other-centered. It is fitting precisely in proportion to the selfishness of the lad in squandering the family fortune. For it symbolizes not cliquish self-indulgence, but the reaching out of love and gratuitous forgiveness and generosity. And that's in his book, The Voice of Jesus, page 42. This is where the parable closes. At the same time, it is very open-ended. It leaves us with a lot of questions to answer. Did this younger son truly repent, or did he just come home to feed his belly? Will he remain with his family, or once he gets his fill, will he take off again? What about the older brother? Will he go into the house for this celebration? Will he receive his brother back, or will he remain angry and stay out in the field? How is God's family similar to this highly dysfunctional family that we have within this parable? How does this parable challenge your view of who God is and how he extends love, mercy, and forgiveness? Or perhaps most importantly, how does this parable challenge and correct your view of the nature of God, your relationship to him, and what his kingdom is like? Next week, our reading from the gospel is from the Gospel of John with Mary's anointing of Jesus' feet, which is also a great story. But you're going to have to wait until then for that story. Until then, peace. <laughs>